All right, I'm going to do a sermon today on the sin of politically correct speaking. I'm going to warn you, if you are a uh, strong believer in gender inclusive or all the other little politically correct categories out there, uh, you're probably not going to like this sermon too much because it's going to offend you in many ways. Um, I'm not offending out of pride or because I want to make people mad or upset, but um, I'm just going to tell the truth. And the truth offends people. Uh, it's a little windy out here today. Uh, the sun's up here hidden behind some cedar trees. It's going to be over there in just a little bit, so a little bit dark right now, but uh, you can see it's a nice sunny day behind me. But where do, you, where do most people take you when they talk about, uh, you know, if you say anything that's politically incorrect, they'll say, you're what? You're judging me. Right? I'm going to show you today where they'll try to quote, but they don't really understand what's going on in the passage. We're going to look at it. Matthew chapter 7. They'll say, well, the Bible says, Jesus, didn't Jesus say, judge not that ye be not judged? Yes, he most certainly did. But what was the context? What's he talking about? See, they won't discuss that. <clears throat> and it's the King James Bible has always said, judge not that ye be not judged. It never said, lest ye be judged. Uh, that's a new version rendering. New versions that come from the Vatican. The Vatican run by a bunch of Satanists. And they are, too, by the way. That's why they pray to Lucifer. I'm not joking. All right. See, again, see already, somebody's offended. That's good. It's good. You see, I'm exercising freedom right now. Freedom of speech is the greatest expression of a, somebody that lives in a, in a system that's not tyrannical. When a government can control the speech of its people, you're living under tyranny. You're not living under freedom. So even the most hardcore, radical, atheistic, whatever, should cheer me when I'm speaking without politically correct speech. When I'm able to just speak freely. Even if you disagree with me, you should agree with my uh, freedom to speak what I believe. And you see, when you have groups like Catholics or atheists or whatever that say, I think that your speech should be censored. I don't think it should be legal for you to say this. This is hate speech. This is, this is uh, whatever, racism or whatever else. What you're having there is you have somebody who's a bigot, who's intolerant. That's not the stand of a Bible-believing Christian. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. Let's read here. It says, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite! First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. Just had to kill a mosquito there on my arm, excuse me. <laughs> what is being talked about here in Matthew chapter 7? Jesus is not condemning judging people. Jesus is condemning hypocritical judgment. The passage is about, if you're going to judge somebody, you better take heed because when you judge, God is going to judge you for that thing that you're saying. In other words, if I say to you, you dirty sex pervert, per I'll get it out. You dirty sex pervert, but yet I'm looking at pornography on the computer at night. See, God's going to judge me that much more harshly because I'm judging hypocritically. You understand? It's not wrong for me to judge. Now, I can say to you that I used to look at pornography, but you see, I got the beam out of my eye. So now I can see clearly to say to somebody, hey, you're in sex perversion. Why? Because I used to be in sex perversion. I understand. All right? I understand that that stuff is wrong, that it leads to wickedness. Sex perversion, the very nature of it, it gets worse and worse and worse with time. That is what is being talked about in Matthew chapter 7. Don't be a hypocrite in judgment, because if you are, then God is going to judge you much more harshly. All right? What you do is, as a Christian specifically, all right, this book is written for us. As a Christian, you clean up those things in your life first, and then you start to go out and judge people. All right? That's what's going on there. 
So to use that and try to say that, uh, well, Jesus, you know, he, he condemned people that judged others. No, no, actually he did not. And, you know, I'll get this thing put on me so many times by little politically correct uh, atheists, is essentially. Anybody who's politically correct, in my opinion, is, is essentially an atheist. They don't believe in God. Um, I mean, there's, there's professing atheists and then there's practicing atheists. Uh, practicing atheists, you have professing Christians that are practicing atheists. Uh, they live without reference to God or to his, to his word. That's what's going on there. But um, they'll, get, they'll put this thing on me all the time. You're not acting Christ-like. You're not acting Christ-like. Well, let's look about how Christ acted. Go next to Matthew chapter 23. This is a chapter that I've actually heard modern Christians claim. They say, I, I'm not even sure if this is really about Jesus because you just can't imagine Jesus speaking this way. Why? You see, because they've created their own Jesus. A Jesus that's far into the pages of this book. Unless, of course, you want to say, you know, the Antichrist, because that's really who they're worshiping. It's interesting because if you look at the modern day Jesus of the modern church, uh, the modern professing Christians, he's the Antichrist. He's who the Bible describes as the Antichrist. He comes in peaceably. He gets all nations to join together. He doesn't judge people. He's effeminate. You know, he doesn't have the desire of women the Bible talks about back in the book of Daniel. Yeah. He calls his craft to prosper in his hands. He's into witchcraft. Dark sentences and things. He's, a, he's an occultist. That's who the modern church worships. That's why when you start to talk about the Jesus of the Bible, they'll get mad. They'll get angry. They'll deny portions of Scripture that talk about who Jesus really was. It's very interesting. Let me show you about Jesus here. Matthew chapter 23, starting in verse 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. In other words, Jesus is saying, you'll, you'll tithe all these expensive herbs, er, not herbs, but... Uh, um, Spices and things like this, things that are very expensive. You'll give money to the temple, the synagogue. You'll, you'll put in all kinds of nice little works, but yet you don't have, uh, you omit the, the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. Yeah, that's exactly what they'll do. It's very, very interesting that these wicked religious leaders are doing that. And it's funny because it goes back to Matthew chapter 7. That's why Jesus calls, calls them hypocrites. You see, their judgment is hypocritical. Their judgment is self-serving. But yet they don't judge themselves. Very interesting. Verse 24, Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. I love that statement. And again, so many people try to change that. They say, well, it, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't actually mean that, that they strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Oh, it means exactly that. All right. Uh, you say, well, explain this to me. Okay. You get people, religious leaders, and we're going to look at who the Pharisees and the scribes are, by the way, as well as the Sadducees. We're going to look at that here from Scripture. Um, but you get these religious people, and uh, what they'll do is they'll strain at something small. You say, do you believe that this book is God's Word, this King James Bible? Well, I, there's, a, there's a verse. It says, you know, the whole, it calls the Holy Spirit it. So... I, I can't accept that as a translation. I think that it's an error and stuff. Okay, then what do you believe? Well, I believe that only the original autographs were inspired, and since there was never a book that had all the original autographs, so I really don't believe that there was ever a book called God's Word that actually was inspired. And the only perfect Bible is what's in heaven, because it's forever thy word is settled in heaven. So they strain at something small. One little word, it. You know, holy the, the King James Bible called the Holy Spirit it. You know, and I've talked about that in other videos, how to, how to explain that. But then they swallow the camel of saying, I'm a Christian, but I deny any Bible is perfect. You see? They swallow something huge, something that's ridiculous, but they won't just say, hey, I can't explain this one little tiny little thing, this little word, it, in the King James Bible. So I strain at that, but I'll swallow the camel. Understand? Right? Happens all the time with religious people. 
they strain at something very, very, very small, something that takes a little bit of faith. You just say, you know what? God's Word says it. I believe it. You see? And they go, well, well I don't know. And you say, well, then what do you believe? And they believe something totally ridiculous, completely ridiculous. I think I've dealt with that for years now. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing to me what people believe. You know, I'll give you another good example. The pre-trib rapture. I call it the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away because that's more scriptural, but let's go with the term for a minute. The pre-trib rapture. Well, I, I just, you know, I don't, I, there's a few problems that I have with it. Okay, then what do you believe? They strain at a gnat. There are some things that are difficult to understand in terms of the rapture, and there's some verses and things. Of course, it's, you know, most of it's cleared up by just rightly dividing the word of truth, realizing what portions of scripture are written to who. Another story. But they'll strain at that little thing, and then you say, then what do you believe? I believe the camel, that the body of Christ goes into the time of Jacob's trouble, and the tribulation, as they call it, and... You know, some might take the mark and, and, and they'll lose their salvation, but yet they can't lose their salvation because they're sealed under the day of redemption. And, and But I think a truly saved Christian, and they got to do all these mental gymnastics. Maybe you can take part of the mark of the beast. You can take the mark, but just not worship the beast. or, or And they, they do this. They swallow the camel. You understand? They'll strain at a, a few little things there with the rapture being before the time of Jacob's trouble. They'll strain at a few tiny little things and turn right around and swallow this huge camel of God sending his bride through a time when he's pouring out his wrath. It's insanity. But let's continue. Verse 25. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Referring back to Matthew chapter 7. Clean up your life first, and then you can judge other things. Verse 27. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. And by the way, Jesus is not saying this someplace to his own little people and stuff like that. He's speaking it right to them. They're standing right there. And you know, I get accused of this. Well, you're just hiding behind a screen or you're, you're hiding behind. I'm putting my face out for the world to see. People cutting up my videos and making me look bad and stuff like that. You know, and if you've seen me and, you know, I street preached against a modern charismaniac Babel building. I will not, I'm not afraid to tell people things to their faces, okay? So don't try to put it on me. Well, you're hiding out in the wilderness someplace. Please, I'm putting these videos out for free to be distributed, copied, put on other people's websites and things like that. My face is online. Type in my name in a Google search and you'll see all kinds of results. So don't even tell me I'm hiding from the world. I'm not. But uh, verse 29, let's continue. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous, and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generations of vipers, generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Jesus speaking. See, so, well, I just don't know. That. Then you reject Jesus Christ. Don't tell me that you're saved, that you believe in Jesus, and yet you reject what he says in Matthew chapter 23. Don't even talk to me about it. Don't even tell me about it. All right? And you say, well, who's Jesus describing in these passages here? Well, we're going to see about that here. Let's look about this. He will judge three groups in the Bible. Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes. Right? So let's turn back to Matthew chapter 15. I'll show you the first group. We'll identify them because these uh, groups, they still exist today. Matthew chapter 15, verse 1. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why did thy disciples transgress the tradition 
of the elders. For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Ooh, you see that? They disobey the commandments of God with their own man-created traditions. What's that church's name that, uh, that says that sacred scripture comes second to divine tradition? I can't think of their name. I, I probably shouldn't say it anyhow because it could offend people. It's called Roman Catholicism with the satanic pope, the, the Jesuit pope, running the thing. A bunch of Luciferian, child-molesting pedophiles. A bunch of devils in the flesh is what they are. Sick perverts. Verse 3. Or, excuse me, verse 4, Matthew chapter 15, verse 4. For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. So it's not just that they're adding traditions to the Bible. They're overthrowing the Bible with their traditions exactly as Roman Catholicism does today. The ancient Pharisees are represented today as Roman Catholics. See where I'm reading to here quick. Verse 9. Verse 7 here. Uh, Matthew chapter 15, verse 7. Let's continue. It says, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Hello, Roman Catholics. You say, well, we're brethren in Christ. You just haven't submitted yourself to the magisterium. Uh, go take a long walk off a short pier, buddy. We're not brothers in Christ. All right? If you're a Roman Catholic, let me tell you right up front, you are going to hell. And until you repent of your Roman Catholicism, until you get out of that system, you will be going to hell. You say, well, I believe Jesus died on the cross for me. Okay, come out of Catholicism. You cannot serve two masters. Don't tell me that you can stay in the Catholic whore system, a system that God condemns, don't tell me you can stay in that thing and be right with God. I don't believe it for one second. Not going to happen. No possible way. Catholicism is an abomination in God's sight. Why? What is salvation? Salvation is a continuing process in Roman Catholicism. They take what Jesus Christ says about his, he's speaking, clearly he's speaking symbolically when he talks about eating his flesh and drinking his blood because nobody came up to him and took a bite out of him and drank his blood. All right? He's speaking symbolically. That's why he said, the flesh profiteth nothing. It is the spirit that quickeneth. He's talking spiritually. He's speaking symbolically. That's why you have communion. You do it only in remembrance of what Jesus Christ did. It's a time of self-examination. That's all it is. It has absolutely nothing to do with your salvation. You could get saved by putting your faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. One time, not perpetual, you're not being saved. You are saved. You are either saved or you're lost. Just the way it is. And you can get saved and you could live for 50 years and never take communion one time and you still go to heaven. But not according to Catholicism. Why? They've taken their tradition of the Eucharist, and they've elevated it above Scripture. And I'll tell you what, if the Catholics take over, if they get power, open power, you know, they're, which they're very close to doing, I mean, everybody that's running for the election here is connected to the Jesuit order, you know, here in America. It's insane. And the whole thing's just fraudulent anyhow, but whatever. Um, but if they get open power, they're going to kill people like me. Why? Because I have speech, free speech, and my politically incorrect speech is saying your mass is a satanic ceremony. And again, let me tell you this. Three places in the Bible, uh, eating of flesh and drinking of blood, raw flesh in other words, is condemned. And yet that's the Catholic plan of salvation. That's what they believe. 
the mass. The priest does his little magic Latin saying thing and the wafer becomes Christ's flesh and the wine becomes his blood. And if you say, no it isn't, that's anathema. You're denying the real existence of Christ's flesh and blood after the priest performs his little mumbo jumbo stuff on it. That's your Pharisee, people. And I'll grant you there's probably other groups out there that I could kick that uh, elevate their traditions above Scripture, but Catholics really represent it the best. <clears throat> what about uh, Sadducees? Acts chapter 23. We'll see what a Sadducee is. <clears throat> Not much changes. <clears throat> Acts chapter 23, verses 6 through 8. But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead I am called in question. And when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. <laughs> you got to love that. Paul just uh, you know, kind of dropped a little bomb on them there, you know, and, and knowing that the Pharisees and the Sadducees had a big disagreement, what it's about, what's it about? Well, look at verse 8. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Hmm. Interesting. So, what are the Sadducees? They're people that say, well, we believe in God, we believe in the Bible and things, but we deny the uh, what would be called the fundamentals of the faith. We're not fundamentalists. So what do you have? Religious liberals. People that say, I deny the uh, blood atonement, I deny the miracles, I deny the virgin birth, I deny some of these things like this, but I'm an evangelical Christian. Uh, no, you're lost. You're lost and on your way to hell is what you are. That's what Sadducees are. Pharisees will hold, they'll elevate their traditions above Scripture. Sadducees will say, we believe certain parts of the Bible. We believe the message of the Bible. But every word of the Bible, no, not really. Okay? Let's kick the last group here. Let's see who the last group, the scribes. Let's see who they are. Go back to Matthew chapter 7. It's real windy today. I hope the audio is not crackling too bad. My back to it. So hopefully I should shield a lot of it. Matthew chapter 7, verse 28 through 29. It says here, And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. You say, okay, what is that? I'll put a little, put a, put a little act on for you, okay? Now, this King James Bible. I was raised with the King James Bible. I love the King James Bible. My grandmother read the King James Bible. I can still remember her in her rocking chair on the front porch reading the King James Bible. And it's a, it's a fine translation, but it's a translation of only a few late manuscripts. And we have today the Nestle's text, and, and, and we've been able to work together with the Vatican to produce much more accurate translations. Translations that have readability without sacrificing accuracy. And you see, that particular verse right there, if you look at the word, the Greek words there, it would be better translated as blah, 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 blah. You see? You say, okay, scribe, what is the Word of God? Well, the Word of God is found in a collection of manuscripts. You see, only the originals were inspired, and all we have today are copies of copies of copies, so inevitably there will be errors that have come in through human error, you know. And uh, so we, we can't really be sure 100% because, you know, God is the perfect Word. He's the incarnate Word. And so that's the only perfect Word that exists today. And we just have translations, copies of copies of co You see? A scribe. Look at, the, look at the preaching of a scribe out there. Look at somebody like a James White or any other papist out there like that. And you get to see these guys, they have no authority at all. It's only themselves. It's all vested in themselves. They'll try to impress you with their knowledge of 
Hebrew and Greek, the original you know, languages. They don't say, you know what? The Bible said so. They won't. They, I mean, you say, oh, I don't agree. Okay, ask James White to hold up a perfect copy of God's Word. Perfect copy, doesn't need to be corrected, doesn't have any errors in it. He won't do it. Tell him to hold it up. Tell him. You say, well, the Greek text that he used, he doesn't believe that for one second. Why? The Greek text is a work in progress. There's always new editions coming out. There was the Nestle's 27th for a few years, and now it's the Nestle's 28th, and then we're going to have to have the 29th and the 30th, and, and you go on and on and on. You see? They don't believe in the authority of thus saith the Lord. So notice, the three groups that Jesus Christ attacked. Number one, you have Pharisees, people that hold their traditions above Scripture. Today, the Roman Catholics. Number two, you have people that deny the miracles, deny the resurrection, deny the spirit, deny angels and things like that. What do you have? You have the Sadducees, you have the modern day liberal, modern Christians, the Methodists and some of these really ultra liberal ones and stuff like this. Well, the Bible's a good book for morals and things, but we don't believe a lot of what's in there, you see? And the third group, you have the new version defenders, those who hate the King James Bible. I'm not talking about some new Christian that's just totally green, that doesn't understand things, and uses an NIV or something like that. Okay? There are people that'll do that, ignorantly. They'll use these new versions that come from the Vatican, and they do. I'm not making that up. They'll use these new versions ignorantly. But when they're shown the truth that it's God's book here, the King James Bible, they'll go, oh wow, I never knew that. And boom, they become a King James Bible believer. And you have people, by the way, too, that are King James only. <laughs> That's all that they'll preach from their pulpit. Why? Because they make a living out of it. I've dealt with those, too. A lot of guys out there, I'm a fundamental, independent, fundamental Baptist. I only use the King James Bible. Nothing but the King James Bible can be used from the pulpit here at Faithful Word Baptist Church or, or whatever, whatever Baptist Church or something like this. They're King James only, but they don't believe the book for one minute. They'll change it whenever they have to. They'll correct it with the Greek. Mm hmm Yeah. What are they? Scribes. They're just a slight different variety of it. They won't go to the Alexandrian, but they'll use the uh, Texas Receptus or something like this to correct the King James Bible. See, your King James Bible is more than just a translation of the Texas Receptus. This King James Bible... God used the translators. They used the Texas Receptus primarily, but they also used ancient uh, Bibles from people like the Waldensians and things like this, early Christian groups. This is the greatest book that's ever been written. And that's scientific fact, by the way, too. That's not my narrow-minded, bigoted opinion. Scientific fact. Never has been there been a book like this King James Bible, and there never will be after it. This is God's book. You don't believe it? Test it. Try it out. Put this book to the test. See if it's absolute truth. Pray about it. Hey, by the way, you new version supporters out there, let me ask you a question. Since you're so much more intelligent than this stupid hillbilly right here, let me ask you a question. These quote-unquote errors that you found in the King James Bible or that you've heard about in the King James Bible, did the Holy Spirit show them to you? Are you willing to go on record and tell me that the Holy Spirit showed you errors in this book? Or was it a James White or a D.A. Carson or John Ankerberg or any of these other lost, hell-bound Catholics? Tell me about it. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Let's look at another place here. John chapter 10. There's a whole lot of people right now. And by the way, let me say one other thing on the new version uh, thing before I say what I was going to say. Um, <clears throat> this whole thing of gender-inclusive speech and things like this. Or, or John chapter 10 I had. Yeah, go to John chapter 10 a while. This whole thing of gender-inclusive speech. Uh, it's very interesting because way back in 2001... The TNIV came out 
and they said, we need to get rid of things like fathers. We'll just say ancestors. We can't say brothers anymore. We'll say brothers and sisters. They're adding and sisters without any Greek manuscript support, even from the corrupt Nestles, Nestle-Lon slash United Bible Society type text. The Alexandrian text used by the Roman Catholic Church. They have no manuscript support at all to change and put in gender inclusive language. And they're doing this back in 2001, 15 years ago. So now people go, oh, the universities are saying that people can't say father anymore. They have to say ancestor or, you know, whatever. They can't say man. They have to say person. The new versions from the Vatican were doing it 15 years ago and further back than that. So who's really leading the movement for this whole uh, transgender pervert system? And by the way, I'm going to tell you this right now. I'll give you a little prophecy, a little word of prophecy here coming up, okay? The Catholic priest, there was one a little bit ago, and he said that uh, he, he had raped like 20-something children like 30 years ago or something like this. Some pervert priest out there, Catholic priest, of course. And this pervert, he came out and he said, I didn't think I was doing wrong because the, the children seemed to enjoy what I was doing to them. You see? First, they had to get rid of the uh, laws against interracial marriage, the anti-miscegenation laws here in America, done back in the 1960s. Loving versus Virginia was the case. Uh, and the two lawyers that, that overthrew the anti-miscegenation laws, they were both Jesuits, Roman Catholic trained Roman Catholic, I should say. The one guy was a Jew. You know, he said he was a Jew. Cohen, I think, was his last name or something. Uh, he's a Jesuit. He's Catholic. Whatever. They had to get rid of that. And then they had to come in and say, okay, now sodomites, two men, two women, they can get married. We'll give them state marriage licenses and all the benefits and everything else that comes from the government, which you shouldn't even be getting as a Christian, but another issue. They gave them those rights. Now it's all transgender people. Guess what's next? Child molesters. And they're already coming out and saying it. And this Catholic priest, by the way, that said that he, he molested these children, yeah, I did it, and I just thought they liked it. No charges filed against the guy. And the brother that I talked about a little while back that had his two twin daughters, little eight-year-old girls, uh, molested by his Baptist pastor, you know, you know what that Baptist pervert, David St. John is the guy's name. Interesting, David S.J., you know, Society of Jesus, <laughs> kind of interesting little thing there. I don't know if he was a Jesuit or not. I think he kind of tend to think he was, but, but uh, he actually said the same thing. In prison, he said, I thought that the children enjoyed it. Yeah, I was molesting children, but I thought that they enjoyed it. That's going to be the defense. And I saw that there was another, you know, this... Uh, mother, they were Hispanic, I think uh, Mexicans or something like this, and, they, and the mother actually came out and she said that she's in love with her son now. Incest. Oh, what's wrong with that? I mean, if we accept, you know, interracial marriage and then, and then we accept, uh, you know, and that's how it started and people go, what's oh, innocent? Well, it wasn't back years ago. <laughs> you know, there were laws against it. But not anymore. <laughs> people don't fear God anymore. But you see, it started with that, and, they, and these people are the ones saying it too, by the way. I'm not just making that up with my own prejudices and whatever else. It started with the interracial marriage thing. Then it went to sodomite marriage. And then now it's going to the transgender thing. And then it's going to go to pedophilia. Pedophilia will become legal. And I'm going to talk about this in the future. Uh, there are certain laws which can be made legal, which you as a Christian have no business at all submitting to. The government has the rights to enforce laws against evildoers, and that's their only right. The government has no rights in education. The government has no right in health care. They have no rights in those areas. And you as a Christian don't have to follow anything that they say in those areas. I'll tell you that. You say, well, what are you, what are you going to do if, if, if they come after you? God's my protector. God protects us. Uh, it's going to be a lot of bunny trails today, <laughs> this thing of this politically correct speech, because I get, I get kicked on this thing all the time. I just wish you wouldn't be so arrogant. You shouldn't be so judgmental. You shouldn't be this. And you should, well, you know, whatever. 
All right. Uh, the biggest thing here, which I need to get across to people is, I, as a preacher, want you to come away from my sermons understanding what I believe. I'm not going to be vague. I'm not going to be ambiguous. I'm not going to have you come away going, I think I understood what he was meaning. You will understand what my stands are. Okay, You will know exactly what I believe, exactly how I feel when you're done watching my sermons. And you're going to know exactly what the Bible teaches as well. But let's continue. John chapter 10, verse 22 is where we're going to start here. And read down through verse 33. This is very interesting. And it was at Jerusalem the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. You look at the works that Jesus Christ did. I mean, healing the blind, people are born blind. John chapter 9 talks about that this guy was born blind and Jesus heals him restores his sight. Nobody's ever been able to do that. There's other times where he's causing the maimed to be whole. I mean, you know, somebody has an arm cut off and the Lord goes, boom, and touches and, and then a brand new arm grows. And people are witnessing this. And yet they're still going, I just don't know if he's God. You know, I, I'd like to see some proof. Or, I mean, could you tell us? You know, and he's going, I did tell you. And I also showed you the works. Let's continue. Verse 26. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Look at this. Here's the key. This is one of the key verses to this whole study. Why is it a sin to be politically correct? Why is it a sin to speak in certain ways to please men? Verse 32, Then answered them, or the, Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of these wor or those works do ye stone me? Look what they say. Verse 33, The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. You know what it is? What this lost world can't stand about Bible-believing Christians? If you're a real Bible-believing Christian, you're going to be morally a very good person. You're going to be a hard worker. You're going to pay your bills. You're going to be a good person to be around. You're going to be someone that's willing to help people. You're going to, you know, we do good things. That's what we do. Why? Well, we, we believe things that are like alcohol, and, you know, drunkenness and, and other things like that, stealing, murdering, whatever else. We believe those things are sin. And if you're truly born again, you're not going to mess with those things. All right. Never mind these heretics out there that tell you it's just belief and that there's no changed life that comes after salvation. Oh, no, there's a big change that will happen. We can attest to that. If you're saved, you can tell people, yeah, boy, you, you should have seen me back in my lost life. I was quite wicked. Now the Lord, now that I'm born again, now that I'm saved, the Lord's helped me to do all kinds of things. I'm a totally different person now. We're good people to be around. You see, we do good works. But why do people want to stone us? Why do people want to kill us? Because of what we say. That's hate speech. That's wrong. You're, you've offended me. You're a bigot. You're a this. You're a that. Mm -hmm. If you are saved and a follower of Jesus Christ... Somewhere, someplace, sometime, you will be attacked because of what you've said. For a good work, we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. You've attacked our system. You've said something negative. You should be stopped. You're intolerant. You're this. You're judgmental. Amen. <laughs> I mean, have you experienced it? Of course you have. And we don't have to go out of our way to be judgmental or, or mean-spirited or, or whatever. We don't have to go out of our way. It will come. It will happen. Just incredible. 
If you are in Christ, brethren, I'm going to tell you right now, you will offend people with your speech. You will. Just the nature of being saved. But what about the Apostle Paul? Certainly we have seen that Jesus Christ was offensive. But what about Paul? Go to Acts chapter 9. There's a bunch of devil-possessed perverts out there. They're trying to say that Paul and Jesus were preaching different things and as far as they were against each other and somehow it made it into the Bible. I mean, okay, you know, yeah, sure. Um, and that Jesus was against Paul and things like this. Uh, no, they don't rightly divide the word of truth. So they don't see that Jesus, what he was preaching, was before his death on the cross. Paul was preaching the gospel that was revealed to him by Jesus Christ. They don't understand that because they're lost. Just as simple as that. Paul and Jesus were working together. Let me show you. Jesus was very much for what Paul did. Turn to, as we're here in Acts chapter 9, we'll start at verse uh, 10. There was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. You'd think he would just trust the Lord, you know. I mean, the Lord says, hey, Ananias, go talk to Saul. He's over there in that house. He's waiting for you. Yeah, but Lord, I... It's always convicting to me to read that and, and other examples like this where the Lord will tell people, do this, and they go, well, but Lord, I... It's convicting, isn't it? But look at the answer of the Lord here to Ananias. Verse 15, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Well, Jesus and Paul were contrary to each other. People don't read the Bible. They don't understand the word of God. Why? The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can they know them, or unto them, neither can they know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Lost people can't understand the book because it's a spiritual book. You get these atheists all the time. I've studied religion. I've studied theology, and it didn't make any sense to me. Yeah, because you're dead in trespasses and sins. You're dead and going to hell. You can't understand the book until you get saved. All that God gives you understanding in is the fact that you're a sinner and that you need to get saved. You need to come him, to Him in a broken, repentant, contrite spirit and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then God will deal with you. Then that book that doesn't make sense, and, and you know, well, I've read the books on theology. Yeah, they're written by lost people like you. Well, it doesn't make sense. It seems to contradict. Yeah, because you're reading from lost people. That's what's going on there. Let's read here, verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Jesus was the one that said, Hey, I'm going to use Paul there. He becomes Paul. He's called Saul, but he becomes Paul. I'm going to use him to take my name out there. And uh, what did he say? Show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Are you suffering for the sake of Jesus Christ? Are you his ambassador? Minister of the gospel? I hope so. That's what we're supposed to be as Christians. But how is it that we offend people? by what we say, by the fact that we preach this book. 
You say, well, uh, I, I don't believe that Paul was offensive to people there, Brother Brian. I, th I think that Paul, you know, you know, he, he went out in love and, and spirit of, of meekness and everything else, and he was, he was a good guy. People respected Paul. Paul was certainly not a controversial man. Um, he just, he was nice all the time, excuse me. <sighs> Took my notes away there. Pretty windy out here today. Let's see about this uh, niceness of Paul. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Here's Paul writing. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. You say, well, I thought we weren't supposed to call people fools. Without a cause, that's correct. You don't just go around calling people fools simply because you don't like them. But if you have a cause, you can go up to any atheist. The Bible says the fool hath said in his heart there is no God. Every atheist out there, you're a fool. You say, well, I find that offensive. Good, good. I'm exercising my freedom of speech as a Bible-believing Christian, not as a First Amendment following, keeping, constitutional, whatever. Uh-uh, Bible-believing Christian. That's where my rights come from. And you have those same rights wherever you are, whatever country you're in. You say, well, Brother Brian, in my country, if we spoke like you spoke, what? You get in trouble? Can't God protect you? Oh, but brother, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm afraid of going to jail. And th I've already crossed the line with the laws in this country. I've already uh, been guilty of a hate speech. You say, then why are you still on YouTube? Because God's protected me. Don't kid me, man. Don't tell me what's because you have a First Amendment right and you're not 501c3 and whatever else. Uh, well, I'm against 501c3, but it's more for the spiritual implications. I don't say I'm not going to be 501c3 because I don't want them censoring my speech. and whatever. I'm not 501c3 because it's wicked. But I understand where my rights come from as a preacher of the gospel. It comes from my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, not from the Constitution. And that's where your rights come from, regardless of what country you're in. But continuing here with this politically correct, nice stuff here. Sure. Verse 23. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie. Interesting. They try to change the book, you know, like the scribes do. And worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. And by the way, let me just say this. The new versions do change that very verse right there. Verse 25. They, they don't say who changed the truth of God into a lie. They say who exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. They changed the God's truth into a lie. That's exactly what they do. Now let's see what Paul says about these types of people. Let's see if Paul is politically correct. And Paul is our example too, by the way. Jesus Christ is our example, but so is the Apostle Paul. Verse 26, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burn in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. In other words, Paul looks at these sodomites, these sex perverts, and, you know, people call them faggot and queer and all this. That's not necessary, okay? Those words aren't biblical words. You're just trying to tick people off. That's not... You know, I don't, I don't mess with stuff like that. I mean, there's, there's a line to draw, okay? Uh, you stick with the Bible, you'll get all the politically incorrect speech you want from it, okay? 
Uh, you don't need to come up with worldly terms to, to just make people angry. That's not necessary. Um, but Paul looks at these people and he says, what you're doing is vile. Oh, well, we're, we're alternate, alternate lifestyle. We're, we're LGBT. And Paul says, you're vile. What you're doing is vile in God's sight. And I'm going to tell you that. I'm going to tell you, you are a vile person. Hate speech, you know. Verse 28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder. That's what some of you like to do to me, isn't it? Debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God. You look at the sodomites out there. You look at the Catholics. You look at the modern evangelicals and stuff like this and the scribes. They hate God. Oh, no, no, no. We love God. We, we worship God. You hate God. You hate the God of this book. I get this thing. You know, I preach this sermon showing that hell is eternal torment. And people go, I, no, I just can't believe in a God that would burn people and torture people forever. Well, I don't believe in a God that tortures people forever, but torments people forever, yes, because that's the Bible word. Well, I just can't believe you're a hater, hater of God, aren't you? Well, I don't know about the God of the Old Testament. I, I just, uh-huh, you know, you're a hater of God. You change the truth of God into a lie. Despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Can you imagine Paul saying that today? How much trouble he would get in? You say, well, uh, I thought you said, I'm trying to make a point. You think Paul cared? And you look at some of the things that Paul suffered where he's beaten with rods and he's stoned the one time they kill him and everything else. Why? Was it for his good works or for his speech? You see? And by the way, Paul just did speak those things through my mouth. You're not going to silence me unless you want to kill me. It's not going to happen. Shut my channel down on YouTube if God gives you permission. Till then, that's not going to happen either. But uh, the fact of the matter is we can still speak the words of Paul, the words of Jesus today to the same groups of people that they were attacking back in the first century. And you say, well, that, then you're going to get labeled as a hate speech or judgmental or that's not politically correct, you're intolerant, you're bigoted, you're whatever. Yeah, just like they were called back then. Are you ashamed of the book? I hope not. So there we have Paul uh, being guilty of what people today would call, uh, you know, you're attacking LGBT or you're homophobic. <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> That's about as ridiculous as people saying Islamophobia. Like, okay, here you got these crazy wingnuts, these Catholic spinoff group, and they're, they're going around and they're killing people, they're blowing people up, they're shooting people, they're stabbing people, trying to cut people's heads off and things, and they do, you know. And, and you say, boy, I don't want them coming to my area. Or oh, are you Islamophobic? Yes, yes. You know, I am afraid of people that are, that are insane. <laughs> Stupid nonsense is what it is. But let's uh, continue here. Titus chapter 1, verse 12. You know, the time's going to have to come, brethren, where we just put our faith in the Lord and uh, we just say, you know what? God's going to have to protect me through this time. And I believe He will. The just shall live by faith. Let's look at some more uh, speech here of Paul. Titus chapter 1, verse 12. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. Do you realize what you just read there? The Cretans are always liars, 
evil beasts, slow bellies. And he says, under the divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this witness is true. Uh, what is that? Well, brethren, that's what you call a racist statement. He marks a group of people, and he doesn't say the sins that they do or some of them. He says, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Picks out a race of people, a group of people, and calls them evil beasts, slow bellies, and always liars. So first Paul in Romans chapter 1 attacks sodomites, the LGBT crowd. You know, he attacks them first. And then he makes a racist statement in the book of Titus chapter 1. Interesting, isn't it? Let's see another thing here. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Doesn't end there. And there's a reason for me going to these examples too, so just stick with it. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9 through 15. It says here, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. Now, if you are a Bible-believing Christian lady, you'll understand that God is not against women. God doesn't hate women. All right, uh, God loves women. He loves you as a woman. I mean, he's written books of the Bible named after women. Esther, Ruth, you know. I mean, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? He doesn't say that about men. God loves women, but he has a special position for women that modern day feminists hate. Feminism is witchcraft, by the way. The modern day feminist movement is just witchcraft with a different name on it. Okay, and don't tell me I saw some, some ditzy woman and she was like, I'm a Christian feminist. It's like saying I'm a Christian Satanist, okay? That can't happen. Why? Because God the Father is masculine. God the Father, Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit of truth, when He comes, He guides you into all truth. He. The Godhead is masculine. So how can you get a woman saying, I'm a feminist? I refuse to submit myself to a man. Then you can't be saved. <laughs> Duh. You know, but again, uh, what do we have here? Paul first goes after the sex perverts, the LGBT crowd. Then he goes after, he cuts on somebody's race, the Cretans. And now he's telling women to mind their, their manners, so to speak, to, to, to be quiet. And he says elsewhere, 1 Timothy chapter 5, that they're to be keepers at home. Isn't that something? Our apostle, as Bible-believing Christians today, Gentile Christians, our apostle says, don't take it easy on the perverts. Don't take it easy on, or speak plainly when it comes to races and things. If there's a wicked race out there, tell them that they're wicked. And also, women are to be kept in their place. And it's a wonderful thing too, by the way. I'm, again, understand that. Why do people get offended at me? When I say that guy's a real idiot or this thing's stupid or that thing's that guy's a jerk or whatever else, or I say things like that. You know what's behind what I'm saying? Love. What you you couldn't be love. See, people have been mind controlled to think that love is me talking to you like you're stupid. Me talking in a way that I just I'm just so nice and just so sweet and everything else. Huh. You know what those that is? Let me show you real quickly. Paul identifies it. And you need to understand this stuff. 
Romans chapter 16, verse 17 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. Evil beasts, slow bellies. Christians are always liars. Hmm. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. You get a Christian that's telling you this thing is stupid, that thing is ignorant, this thing is sin, it's wickedness, it's, you know, whatever. It's because I love you. When you get somebody who professes to be a Christian and yet they're monitoring their speech and they're being gender inclusive and all this other stuff, it's because they hate you. They're trying to deceive you. I mean, if you're going to walk into a trap, I'm going to be yelling and screaming saying, stop, stop, don't walk into that. Why? I care about you. I'm concerned. You know, atheists out there, I call you fools because that's what the Bible calls you, and I'm trying to turn you from your wickedness. You've fallen for a satanic philosophy called evolution. It's a religion. You are not in an atheistic thing where you don't believe in God and stuff, and you just kind of go and live your life. That isn't it. That's why you militantly defend your religious convictions as an atheist. Right? That's why you do stupid things like attacking the Bible and you, you attack Jesus Christ and things like that. I'm trying to turn you from that. Why? Because if you don't turn, you're going to burn. Very simple. Sodomites, perverts out there. If you're a sex pervert, let me tell you something. You better get saved. Because if you don't get saved, if you don't turn from your wicked lifestyle, you're going to burn forever and ever and ever and ever. I told this story before, but I had a neighbor right down that way. And, uh, he was a drunken Roman Catholic. And I witnessed to him, and we, we did whatever we could. We gave him gospel tracts. We did everything we could. And he rejected Jesus Christ. He told me, he, he yelled at me the one time, and he said, I will never believe what you believe. Less than a year later, he died in his own vomit, upside down in, the, in, a, in a bathtub, fell face forward and vomited, drowned in his own vomit, and now he's burning and screaming in hell. And he'll be there forever. You say, well, no, he just burned up. He will be there forever. I don't take any pleasure in that. That's why I'm saying things. That's why I'm offensive in my speech. Because, number one, I'm a free man. God gives me my freedom. And number two, because I love you. That's why I'm going to speak very harshly. That's why Jesus Christ spoke harshly. That's why Paul spoke harshly. We are not, Bible believers are not ambiguous. We are not people that have just come out and we just try to sugarcoat things. And, well, you know, I think that God, he hates the sin, but he loves the sinner. You won't even find that in scripture, you know. Uh, and, and I think that he, he, he loves you. And, and No, he doesn't love you. God loved you enough to send his son to die on the cross. Loved, past tense. And if you don't come to the cross of Jesus Christ, you don't have God's love. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, the Bible says. I know the terror of the Lord. That's why I got saved. I'm not about to face a holy, righteous God who's perfect and have Him judge my sins. It's if I got one sin, I go to hell. You say, well, that doesn't seem just to me. It's just, you see, because God said His Son to die for sinners. So your sin qualifies you for salvation. Don't you understand that? You say, I thought you said sin sends you to hell. Sin sends you to hell if you reject Jesus Christ as the cure. But your sin is what qualifies you for salvation. All you got to do is just say, I'm a sinner. I can't save myself. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. Boom, you're into heaven. Get to live with the Lord for all of eternity. Your sins are totally washed away. But let's continue here. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. <coughs> Second Corinthians chapter 10. We'll start at verse 8. Verse 8. 
Paul says here, For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed, that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. For his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. That's what these people are saying. These carnal Corinthians are saying, Paul's speech is just so contemptible. I just don't think he should talk that way. <laughs> yeah, hello. <laughs> Heard that before. Verse 11 says, Let such an one think this, that such as we are in word by letters when we are absent, such will we be also in deed when we are present. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Very interesting there, because that's exactly what a lot of people do. Well, I just never heard a preacher say this, and I just never heard, you know, you're comparing yourself among yourselves. What does the Bible say? That's the standard. Verse 13, But we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure, as though we reach not unto you. For we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. Not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labors, but having hope, when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you, and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord, for not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. Now i got to speak foolishly here for a little bit, just like Paul did here. Um, verse 8, he has to boast somewhat of his authority. A lot of people say I'm false and I'm not saved and whatever else. Brian Nellinger is a false convert. He's a, he's a wicked works salvationist and all this other stuff. Okay, then uh, let me ask you a real simple pointed question. Uh, why hasn't God stopped me? If I'm not legitimate, if this ministry is a totally fake, fraudulent ministry, uh, why am I still here? Why have people's lives been changed by this ministry? You know why? Because it is legitimate. God tells me what to say, and I say it. And if I mess up, I'm going to be the first one to come out and make a video. Again, put my face out there and say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I've done that in the past. You say, well, I proved you wrong. Oh, these people, you know, oh, I proved Brian wrong. I wrote to him, and he wouldn't say this, and he wouldn't say Yeah, because I'm not wrong. You know? <laughs> oh, that sounds so arrogant. You think you're right and everybody else is wrong? Well, if I line up with the book, then yes. You see? Oh, you shouldn't have a standard like that. <laughs> what kind of a preacher would I be if I just always changed when anybody confronted me on something? Regardless of what the Bible says. You see, if God is for ministry, God will allow that thing to continue and it will prosper. And I don't mean money and, and subscribers and things like that. I'm not talking about that. Supposing that gain is godliness from such you know, withdrawal thyself. First Timothy chapter 6 talks about that. What I'm talking about is there will be fruit that will be born by that ministry. In my time in ministry, I've seen Jews get saved. That's amazing. That's the very best thing. I mean, there was a, a, a Jew that wrote the one time and he said, you know, I'm, I was, you know, I'm a Jew and, and I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Messiah. Wow. I mean, praise the Lord. I've seen that. I've seen Roman Catholics get saved. I've seen witches. I've seen, I've seen some amazing people get saved as a result of this ministry. You say, what are you doing? Well, uh, let him that glory, or uh, let him that glory in the Lord, but he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord, verse 17. <laughs> you know, I'll glory in the Lord. Hey, praise the Lord. I've seen people, you know, I've gone to seminary all these years and, and I've learned more from your ministry, Brother Brian, than I've learned in all my years in seminary. Wow, praise the Lord. You know, but if I was some punk out there that was just running my mouth and just being a jerk and whatever else, and I didn't have any love and, and things behind what I'm trying to say to people, uh, God would have stopped me a long time ago. He say, no, you're just, you're just uh, going forward just like a false prophet would. Um, let me just tell you a little, clue you in on a little secret here. Um, there have been many times I've tried to quit the ministry. There have been many times I've been just like, okay, I put the Bible down. I say, Lord, I'm going to read your word. I always will but I don't want to be in ministry anymore. I'm going to go back to the secular world. I mean, I, I've had it planned sometimes. I mean, I have been, I've been like, I am ready to just 
<laughs> be done with this whole thing. It is such a headache and whatever else. And the Lord brings somebody along and says, Brother Brian, you just, you know, you changed my life and whatever. Could you please do a study on this? And I get excited to do the study. And I'm like, okay, one more study. I'll do one more. And then I'm quitting for sure. And then I do another and I do another, <laughs> you know. The Lord has his commendation on this ministry. And the Lord will keep this ministry online until he says, no more. It's not my decision to make. All right. If it, if it was my decision to make, if the Lord said to me, uh, what do you want to do here? Um, you know, I would probably just go back to the secular world again. I, you know, I'm always going to be a Bible believing Christian. I'm, that's never going to change. But uh, the, the headaches and the, the irritation and things of having to deal with people and uh, just constantly being attacked and put down and just, just, you know, it wears you out. I mean, if you have any kind of a, a channel on YouTube and you've done any kind of videos or anything else, uh, you'll see the comments coming and you'll you'll get kicked around and stuff. You you understand somewhat, you know. I mean, it's it's incredible, but God commends this ministry and He keeps it going. And one of the reasons for it is because back when I went into ministry many years ago, I actually went in probably about 2007 is when I went full time in in ministry. 2008 is when I started on YouTube, but uh, that whole time I made up my mind. I'm never going to be ambiguous. I'm never going to be vague. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say what I mean and mean what I say. And that's what I've always done. And I know it offends some people and some people get upset about it and whatever else. Nothing I can do about that. But I'm going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ someday and I'm going to have to look at my Savior in the face and I'm going to have to, to realize that if I was vague, if I didn't really tell people what the Bible says, if I kind of covered things up because I feared man more than I feared my Lord, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer for that. See, my works someday are going to be tried by the fire at the judgment seat of Christ. And uh, only the gold and silver and precious stones, that's the only thing that's going to survive. The wood, hay, and stubble is going to burn up. The wood, hay, and stubble is what you do for yourself. What you do in your flesh. The gold, silver, and precious stones are things you do for the Lord. Okay, and just to give you a little synopsis quickly there. The gold is things that you do for the Lord, you know, for God. It's His righteousness in you. Be holy for I am holy. The silver, what is the silver? Well, the Lord, words of the Lord are pure words. Is silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Things you do to defend this book, you know, uh, glorify the word of the Lord the King James Bible. We're going to see that here as we finish up this study. And the precious stones are souls. Do you affect people? <clears throat> Do you lead souls to Jesus Christ? Do you affect those precious stones that are out there through exhortation, encouragement for the brothers and sisters that you have in Christ? Those are the things that are going to go through the judgment seat of Christ, the fire that tries your works. The things that you do for yourself, you know, not going to make it through. That's another issue. Let's continue with what we're saying here. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 11. Just jump over to chapter 11, verse 6. Paul says here, But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. Uh, I'm very rude in speech sometimes, and, and rude can, all, can mean... You know, kind of like crude sometimes, calling people idiots and whatever else. But rude also means uh, kind of a, like you're an uneducated hillbilly, you know. Uh, that's A lot of the people think that about me. And, um, you know, it's funny because back in the book of Acts, it says that at one point they perceived that they were unlearned men. You know, Peter, I forget who it was that was with him. Peter and John, I think it might have been early on in the book of Acts. But uh, that's what you're going to get too. Oh, you're uneducated. You don't have this. You don't have that. Well, um, I am rude in speech many times. I, uh, you know, <clears throat> I say some things sometimes. I get tripped up in my words and whatever else. Sometimes my speech is quite contemptible. But I'll say this, in, and it, I say it with humility. I'm not trying to be prideful or boastful here, but uh, I sp studied for many, many years. I'm not just some little YouTube uh, one-hit wonder that, that just came along and I've watched videos on YouTube so now I'm a professional preacher or something. 
Uh, no, I spent quite a few years studying before I made my very first video. Um, and uh, people need to understand that. Uh, I'm, not, um, I'm not foolish and I'm not uneducated, so to speak. I've read quite a bit. So, <clears throat> we'll finish up here. And here's the real issue. What is the conclusion of the matter? Turn back to Mark chapter 8. <clears throat> and I'm saying this is a great exhortation to my brothers and sisters in Christ out there because you're going to have this thing put on you. You're going to have this thing of, <clears throat> you know, you're, you're offensive. You shouldn't be so offensive. You should be loving and not judgmental and all this other stuff. Um, you're going to have that put on you. And I'm trying to show you today what the Bible says about that subject. So let's look here. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. <clears throat> it says here, And when he had called the people unto him, with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. You know, I've seen that thing time and time again. First of all, if you're a Christian, you should be his disciple. I mean, you can reject the Lord as far as uh, serving him and stuff and just kind of go and serve yourself your whole life long uh, and have the Lord fight you and chasing you the whole time. Um, but you really ought to be his disciple and follow him. And when you lose your life, you're actually saving it. Uh, it's very interesting because... As I said, I mean, there's been times I've been so discouraged. I'm just like, you know what? I quit the ministry. I'm out of here. I'm going to do my own thing and, and whatever else. And uh, the Lord, you know, he, he understands, you know, he'll understand your frustration. There's times of frustration and he'll get you back on your feet. Okay, come on, come on. Let's, let's get back to work here, you know. And uh, it's at those times that the Lord will bless you. Um, I'm in better health right now than I was when I was in my 20s. And you say, well, then it's because of your, your exercise and all this other stuff. No, it's actually because of serving the Lord. Yeah, I mean, I have times where I, my health is not real great and things. But uh, for the most part, the more hardcore I get with my stands for the Lord, the more I speak up for the Lord, uh, the more I have blessing in my life. The more the Lord does things for me, the greater life I have. See, if I start to think about, I got to please men, I have to, I have to speak in ways that are not offensive to people. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to save my own life. I'm trying to save my own neck. I'm trying to say, I don't want to go to prison for hate crimes. So I better kind of tone it down a little bit. I'd better not just, and I'm not talking about just being offensive on purpose. Okay. I'm, I'm not talking about that. You shouldn't do that. What I'm talking about is just, just speak the word of God. You know, you get some relative that says, hey, I don't appreciate what you said there or whatever else. You say, then go to hell. What? Are you swearing at me? No, I'm not swearing at you. I'm saying, if you're offended by Jesus Christ, if you're offended by what this book says, you're going to hell. I'd like to warn you about it. I'd like to tell you not to go to hell. But if you're convinced that you want to go, then go to hell. It's as simple as that. And when you do that, you're not seeking to save your own life. You see what I'm saying? You're saying... I'm going to serve Jesus Christ no matter what it costs me. And it's at that point the Lord will keep you safe. All these rules, all this stuff. Oh, we're going to pass laws. You can't say Father anymore. You have to, I'm going to say Father. You, know, you can't say, uh, you know, Sodomite. I'm going to say Sodomite. You can't do that. We're going to shut your channel down. Only if God gives you permission. This channel will exist until God says, okay, that's it. No more. Verse 36. You say, well, why would you keep your mouth shut? Here's why. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You see, that's what you're worried about, isn't it? When you keep your mouth shut, when you don't want to offend people. It's because you're trying to gain the world. I just want to be friends with the world. I mean, I just want to be friends with my coworkers and my family, and I don't want to be ousted. You know, I see this thing all the time, you know, and, and, 
and I've done it myself sometimes. I'm not I'm not ripping on you if you do this. I mean, it's it's hard sometimes. You you know, you just well, I don't want I didn't want to say anything because you know, if I do, I'm not going to be asked to come over for family get-togethers anymore, and and they're not going to want to be around me, and I just kind of want to keep my mouth shut. What are you trying to do? Didn't Jesus say that that uh, there's going to be division among families because of him? He came not to bring peace, but a sword. The sword of the Spirit. Didn't he say that? Oh, but 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 I just I, I couldn't couldn't bear to think if my friends and my family turned against me. Are you trying to gain the world? But look at verse 38. Here's where we're, gonna, where we're going to end this study. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Hmm. And I realize dispensationally, you know, it's talking mostly to the uh, Jews there that are going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. I understand that. But, uh, you know, there's all scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Uh, and that's written to a Christian. And, you know, we can read that portion there in Mark. And uh, you better take that to heart. Because there's an awful lot of people that are ashamed of Jesus Christ and they're ashamed of this book. And they say... You know what? If I preach this book as it stands, I'm going to offend people. I might get in trouble with the law. I might get accused of a hate crime. I might get accused of being narrow-minded, bigot, prejudiced, whatever. My suggestion is that you stand by this book, brethren. It's very important. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank You, Lord, for Your Word. I thank You for the fact that You are clear in Your speaking and in Your teaching and Your preaching. And uh, You give us a great example, Lord, with Yourself and then also with the Apostle Paul and uh, with many other Christians down through the centuries. Lord, we can study church history and see the, the men that have spoken up and uh, preached Your Word and uh, that are oftentimes very offensive to the lost world, but it's all because we love the lost and we want to warn them about the serious nature of dying in their sins. Lord, I pray that everybody out there would get a backbone and that we would learn to fear you and not man and that we wouldn't worry about being politically correct in our speech, that we wouldn't worry about offending. And Lord, if it comes to that point where we get put to death because of standing for your word, then so be it. You were put to death. The Apostle Paul was put to death. And I realize, Lord, that it will come to the Christians if you wait much longer. Um, but Lord, I pray that you would help us to really understand that we can also fight this whole politically correct system, this wickedness that it is. And we can fight against it and thereby um, preserve the state uh, of this nation and also other nations where Christians are not being put to death yet. Um, by a man of understanding, your word talks about the state of, of a nation being prolonged. And that is my prayer, Lord. Um, I pray that we're willing to die for you, but yet at the same time willing to stand up for your truth and to speak out while we can. And uh, Lord, if there's anybody that's lost watching this to, at this point, I pray that they would realize that they are in very serious danger of eternal hellfire and that they would come to you for salvation today. And I just uh, ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. That's going to be it for this study. Just wanted to put this thing together because it's, it's something I've been attacked on for so many years now. And people say I'm offended by your speech and things like this. And they don't understand why I speak the way I speak. Um, for years and years and years, I put up with going to preachers and, and they're just total hypocrites. I mean, they're, they're talking out of two sides of their, their head, you know, kind of a deal. I mean, one minute it's, you know, this is God's book. The next minute, well, it's, it should be better translated as, you know, they're scribes. Um, I've been around modern Christians, you know, Sadducees, that, oh, yes, I believe the Bible has some good moral lessons in it. 
but it's the message, it's not the words. And I don't agree with some of the things, yeah, Sadducees. And I've been around Catholics as well as uh, other people like that that hold their traditions above Scripture. Um, again, you know, I was raised around a form of Catholicism with uh, the Amish. They have their ordinung, or the, which they hold above Scripture. You know, you can't, you're, you're, the hat brim has to be a certain size and you can't have a, a band around the hat and you have to have your beard cut a certain way, no mustache and all this stupid nonsense. And they're all work salvationists, you know, real work salvationists. You have to maintain perpetual works to continue to merit your salvation. Uh, absurd. But I just, I really do pray that Christians um, would not care what people think about their speech and that we would just speak the truth, speak it in love, but speak boldly and um, call perverts perverts. Uh, if there's a, a particular race of people that are doing things, you know, the Arabs, uh, Arabic people, I'm, I'm glad to hear if, if one of them gets saved, but uh, the Arabs are, are uh, the descendants of Ishmael. Um, they're, they're very, very fleshly people, very wicked people for the most part. I'll call them out, like the Cretans. Um, most of your Arabic people are evil beasts. Okay. You say, well, that's racist. Well, I'm not saying to wipe them all out. I'm just simply saying, you know, a lot of them are very evil. It's, this Islamic stuff proves that. Uh, can one of them get saved? Absolutely. Sure. Uh, praise the Lord when they do. I would never exclude anybody uh, from salvation simply because of their race or their nationality, ethnicity, whatever you want to call it. Um, so, but I think we just, we really need to be careful not to freely give up our, our biblically centered speech. Um, I think that that's wrong. And I just, I really do pray that the body of Christ would stand firm on God's word and say, no, you're not going to take my speech from me. So that's going to be it. And keep going off on this subject because this is a this is one that's very near to me, <laughs> and dear to me. Um, just just speak the truth, brethren. Don't worry about laws or whatever corrupt systems are passed. Uh, don't worry about that stuff. Put your faith in the Lord; He'll protect you. That's going to be it. Thank you for watching.